Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to, to Chris as well and um, the Balanced Enterprise Research Network for, for hosting this, this event. Um, I, I do stand before you slightly dishevelled and um, just off the, the plane from, from Europe, so my, my head's a little bit over over India somewhere at the moment, I think, so please bear with me. But it's, um, it is a, a wonderful way to return to Australia, having, um, having seen major investment banks make such important statements around what we know if we follow the issue of fossil fuels in Australia is a, is a real gateway project to what would be a completely unacceptable opening up of new coal reserves in, in Queensland. And it's, it's giving the campaign an enormous amount of momentum. So, and I think it's a sign of the times um, that we can get these kind of commitments now. Um, the world is changing very quickly as we know. Anyone that follows the issue of climate change, its impacts, the solutions, how those solutions are being rolled out, um, you'll probably be as amazed as often as I am at the, the pace and the scale of, of change that's taking place. And we know that we've got the solutions, the question is how quickly can we roll them out? And increasingly so, over the last couple of years, those solutions have been around finance. Um, I think a lot of it's got to do with the work that uh, has been initiated by the likes of 350, and I want to just pause and acknowledge that this is an event that's also um, delivered by 350.org, who we're, we're proud to work closely with a number of events, and um, I know Charlie is at the back there, the uh, campaigns director of 350 Australia, and Josh is, Josh is here as well. Um, and so a, a big thank you to you for being part of this event as well. Um. But, but that work has really in, in, instilled the notion in a lot of people that it's not just what we do at home, the decisions we, we take, where we source our, our products, who we vote for, it's also where our money sits and, and what the institutions who are custodians of that money can actually do with it. Um, and people are increasingly saying that I don't want to have my money associated with things that are against my values, in particular the industries that are driving climate change, driving environmental destruction, um, namely the fossil fuel industry, coal, oil and gas. That's what it comes down to um, at the moment. So when people do that, and we've been very pleased to be able to, to take people up on their concerns, um, 350 and market forces have worked together on events that have shifted hundreds of millions of dollars worth of business away from in banks that are heavily investing in fossil fuels. But the first thing that comes up is, well, what do we do? What are the solutions? Where do we put our money? Uh, and it's, it's a universal concern and it's a universal question. And it's not just at the individual level that this question's been asked. You've got solutions being undertaken at an institutional level. You've got things like in initiatives such as the FTSE Group in, in London and BlackRock, the world's biggest uh, fund manager, working on providing solutions to other investors that are fossil free options. So that's only being driven by demand. You have seen in Australia, we've had an announcement from Unisuper early this year that they're going to be screening out fossil fuel companies from their socially responsible index. Yesterday, AMP Capital made a similar announcement that their, uh, their responsible investment leaders funds would be excluding some coal and oil, unconventional oil stocks. Uh, and just today, um, it's, who was it today? It was Hunter Hall, another investment man, another fund manager, said they were going to go fossil fuel free as well. So there's a huge amount of change taking place. You know, and we're talking hundreds of millions, billions of dollars at a time worth of funds that are, will be excluded or partially excluded from fossil fuels. And it's happening at a university level too. We've seen Stanford, $18.7 billion fund, announced that it's going to screen out coal. We did see the uh, Reed College in Oregon make a similar announcement with a $500 million fund, although that was a yes man um, prank, but um, hopefully that'll soon become, the, become reality. That's what they try and do. And let's hope that Sydney Uni's not too far behind. But of course, those are institutions and, and we're not institutions. Um, we're here as individuals. And trying to deliver on this, uh, this concern that people have of, well, what do I do? Where are my options is something that Certainly 350 and, and market forces have, have had at the front of our mind for a long time and, and we're extremely proud to be launching this report which is aimed at individuals who just want to get their money away from those institutions who would use it to fund the fossil fuel industry. Um, and it's going to be talked through in, in length so I won't go into it now. Um, but I'm 
extremely honoured and privileged to be able to, to be here and present this to you because it is a great package of solutions that anyone can use, use in their own communities, use, spread amongst their family, friends, um, and continue to drive the momentum that we're seeing. We've been impressed today by how fast this issue has changed over recent months, but who knows how much faster we can move now that we've got these solutions in our hands. So we've got three speakers that um, I'll present to you tonight. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Tim Buckley from the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, who will speak to you about the, the sort of state of play, the current the fossil fuel landscape. Then uh, Tom Swan uh, from the Australia Institute will go through the report in more detail and present the findings. And uh, finally, Trevor Thomas um, from Ethinvest will talk about some of the options and pathways that exist for people who do want to divest and engage um, as customers, as shareholders. Um, ways that you can use your, as we say, use your money as a force for good. And then we'll have time for a Q&A. So we'll have about 30 minutes where you can ask questions of the, the panel as well before we wrap up. So I'll firstly hand over to Tim. Um, just a quick introduction. Tim is the Director of Energy Finance Studies at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. It's IEFA. I always have to unpack that with, uh, with caution. Um, Tim's got 25 years of financial markets experience, having spent the majority of his time as a uh, top-rated equities um, research analyst in Australia with some time covering global and Asian equity markets. He's also spent, the, uh, let's call it a, a very good chunk of the last four or five years, studying renewables and the transition to renewables. Tim's worked with, uh, with Citigroup for 17 years, and that culminated in his role as the managing director and head of Australasian equity research for the, previous, uh, the last six years um, of his time at Citi. So a, an immense uh, wealth of experience in the financial sector and I'm um, very pleased to hand you over to Tim Buckley. Right. Good evening. I'm going to just set, as Julian said, set the scene for tonight's discussion by giving a little bit of a background as to the state of play in the fossil fuel industry. I thought I'd touch on four points. Firstly, the coal industry outlook. Secondly, the uh, gas, is it a transition fuel? Thirdly, regulatory inertia. Anyone in Australia knows about that. And then finish on a highlight, which is renewables and energy efficiency. So, and I'll do all that in a couple of minutes. So. Um, and I just wanted to, I'll end with two slides because I do, I am an optimist. I do believe there is definitely a solution. I think we're actually globally working towards that solution and that is why I spend most of my time looking outside of Australia so I can remain positive. <laughs> so with that intro, coal. Coal industry, um, you might be surprised to know that globally coal company share prices are down between 50 and 95 plus percent in the last three, four years. That's pretty telling. I say 95% plus because a couple of the biggest majors in the US have gone bankrupt in the last two years. So of the five majors, three have been bankrupt. Uh, one's come out of it and it's looking like it's going back in. Um, they all over leveraged during the commodity boom through mergers and acquisitions. So they all have come into this recent downturn with way too much financial debt and therefore a lot at risk to the companies. But the same applies if you're looking at Chinese coal companies, the same applies if you're looking at Australian coal companies. Um, so the share price is definitely off. Why? A number of factors. The thermal and coking coal prices down 50%, give or take, from their highs. That's a pretty major sign that the market is changing. It's in quite dramatic change, as Julian said. Secondly, demand is weaker than expected, and I'll go on to that in a minute. Thirdly, because the demand is weaker than expected, we are left in a global coal industry which is facing oversupply. So we've got way too much capacity coming on stream at a time when demand is weaker than expected, and that is actually being dramatically uh, ex uh, extended because of take or pay contracts, which means that the coal companies are committed to mining expansions, they actually have legal liabilities that attach if they now don't go ahead with their expansions. So, Take or pays to me are a major problem for the coal mining industry, both in Australia and America. Uh, so to me, the financial markets are now debating whether this is a long cyclical downturn or whether it is a structural downturn. And you'll obviously hear from me giving the perspective I believe it is moving rapidly towards a structural 
um, decline of coal. So then to broaden the debate, is gas the long-term transition fuel? Is it part of the solution or is it part of the problem? Um, I would say the answer is yes for America, but no for most of the rest of the world. Why yes for America? Because ultimately their gas price is at a record low or close to record lows, down four or five US dollars per MMBTU. Their long-term average is about eight. So you've actually got um, gas being priced very, very competitively against any other fuel source in America, be it renewables or other fossil fuels. So it is transforming their economy, but it is also regionally quarantined because they don't have a whole lot of LNG export facilities. If you look at other markets, other major energy markets, be it Japan, China, Europe, um, India, and I'd, I'd actually add Australia in for, the, for a different reason, but anywhere where LNG pricing is moving to global parity, gas is actually not a cheap fuel source because the cost of processing LNG and then transporting it means it's actually quite an expensive solution, which might then make you ask, why did China and Russia just sign a massive landmark deal to, uh, for China to import 400 billion US of gas from Russia? It's all about energy security, energy diversity, and uh, an attempt anything but coal. But it is part of their solution, but it is expensive solution. So it's maybe a, well, temporary. It's 30 or 40 years, so it's not that temporary. And I suppose that's why I say it's not a transition if you're signing 30, 40 year contracts or building 30 to 40 year plants. The third point I'd make was about regulatory inertia. And there is a clear lack of global leadership. That's the negative side of it. We have, um, Europe was a global leader, it's certainly um, forging ahead, but the global financial crisis really has sidelined their efforts. So they just don't have the financial capacity to be a strong leader. You've got India sitting there saying, the West caused the problem, we should take the lead in fixing it. And that's totally understandable. Australia, we've clearly got very negative momentum. And the US. The US Senate looks like the Australian federal government. They are absolutely opposed to any progress, but I do have a silver lining there. I think President Obama has a very different agenda. He's got a landmark announcement coming on Monday night next week, Monday night our time, and that is to do with the 1970 Clean Air Act and allowing the EPA to aggressively regulate air pollution. So we would look to that, and I think the Chinese will actually look to that. If America is willing to take the lead with Obama, then China will actually come out more aggressively in their global rhetoric because the reality is what they're doing behind the scenes is absolutely world leading. Which is how maybe the intro to the final point that I'll talk about, which is renewables. Renewables and energy efficiency, I do see them as a global transition solution that is in train already. The trouble is it takes a long time. So obviously the question is how long do we have? But I'll end on two slides. This one, um, I just put it up there as a reminder that renewable energy installs globally, be it hydro, solar and increase, sorry, hydro, wind and increasingly solar, there is actually a huge amount of renewable energy going in globally. Might not be any going in in Australia, but it's all going in globally. And um, you are looking at that. We've gone through 100 gigawatts, so 100,000 megawatts of new capacity coming in every year. Last year, this year will be 110 or more, and it's continuing to grow. So people talk about the investments going down at the moment, but the reality is it's cheaper to install renewables each year, so therefore the absolute volume of import of renewable installs is actually still um, rising. And that's a very powerful trend. Why? Because ultimately renewable energy cost reductions continue, and that's being driven by economies of scale and technology gains. And maybe just to illustrate that, a second and last slide. That is a slide from First Solar, which is one of the top solar players in the world. They forecast that cost of installed solar will drop from $1.59 US per watt to 99 cents per watt by, 19, by 2017. So in the next four or five years, the price of solar is going to continue dropping about 10% per annum. I think that's actually quite conservative because the dollar fifty nine, if you look at what the American installs were in the last two years, they've actually been up at three or four dollars per watt. So First Solar is saying that they are happy to contract to supply solar fully installed at less than a dollar within three years. 
And at less than a dollar, in any country with good solar resource, that means it's totally competitive with, um, with fossil fuels. The other aspect there is energy efficiency is also having a dramatic impact. It's had a dramatic impact in Japan post Fukushima. I think Japan's it led the world in, in energy efficiency. The world's still got to learn from what, they're, um, what they've learnt. But you are seeing energy efficiency, meaning that global, sorry, electricity demand growth in Europe, Australia and America in four of the last five years has actually declined. In Europe, America and Australia, electricity capacity, demand has declined in four out of the last five years. That is a really telling point because if you combine it with increased install, so capacity of renewables is going up, energy demand is actually flat to declining if you exclude China and India. Therefore, you are actually the only inevitable outcome is that fossil fuels are being squeezed out of the equation. And so to finish, the, to me, what makes me really bullish about the long-term transition that we're talking about, renewables are a very deflationary driver. The cost of renewable energy is declining every year, and once you install it, the cost is fixed for the life of the project. It's fixed for 25 years, fixed at today's price. There is no inflation. So the energy markets, as for the last 100 years, have seen more than average inflation every year for 100 years, renewables will be a very major deflationary impact, particularly as once you've installed the renewable, it's almost a zero marginal cost of, of running it. So therefore it undercuts any fossil fuel players. So to me, that's what makes me bullish. You have increased capacity, reduced cost, and that will just constantly undermine fossil fuels. So hopefully that sets the scene, and I'll pass to Tom to, uh, what are you gonna do intro? Or? Thanks so much, Tim. As I um, as I move back here and go to Tom's slide, um, Tom slide, I'm just thinking that this is um, if you take this report home, you've probably come here because you care about climate change and you want to be part of the solution to that. But if you suddenly your morals abandon you overnight or something like that you wake up tomorrow morning, you don't really care about climate change anymore, but you care about your money. I mean, what Tim's just outlined there is, it doesn't matter. This is still just as relevant. You know, we're seeing increasingly commentators talk about the sort of trends that Tim sort of outlined in the uh, decline of stocks of fossil fuels, the, 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 the collapse of the market internationally, or the, the continually oversupplied market, and the collapse of the price of coal as a structural decline, not something that is is going to rebound. You'll get parts of the coal industry obviously still saying that the future's bright, but um, you look at some of the major investment houses, the research houses, and they're saying it's less, less, less. It's down, down, down. Um, so this is a great bit of uh, investment material as, as well as uh, tools on how to, um, uh, how to help avoid runaway climate change. But the report itself um, is a product that uh, 350 and, and Market Forces Commission from the Australia Institute and, and Tom Swan, the next speaker, had an enormous amount to do with it, and we've got a, a great amount of admiration for the uh, the work and the and the effort that Tom's put in. Um, Tom's is a researcher at the Australia Institute. He works on fossil fuel divestment and other topics. He's um he's also he's a student of the Master of uh, Climate Change program at the ANU, focusing on policy and politics and conducting research into the political economy of unburnable carbon. And so he found time in amongst all that to, uh, to produce this, uh, this report for us. But um, before I hand over to Tom, also just acknowledge he's, he's played a very important role in the fossil fuel divestment movement at a, at a campus level, having been involved in the, uh, the ANU campaign to get ANU out of, out of Met Gasco, and that's yielded a lot of momentum on campus there. So um, with that, I'll hand over to Tom Swan. Thank you very much, Julian. It's a great honour to be here uh, presenting to all of you the result of a lot of uh, very late nights. Um, this is actually the second, uh, second part of a two-part research project, and I'll cover both parts uh, in what I'm going to go over now. But I thought I might start with a quote from a great, very radical uh, thinker on climate change. Safeguard creation, because if we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. Never forget this. This is actually the Pope. Uh, within the last fortnight. And a quote from another great moral leader, our future depends on what we as a nation do today. This challenge is not of our making, but we accept responsibility to fix it. 
that's Joe Hockey uh, introducing the budget. And uh, soon after that, he went on to speak about the sustainability of pensions and of health and of education, sustainability of pretty much everything but actual sustainability. Um, of course, there's no greater sustainability issue uh, than climate change and our dependence on climate change, our energy systems, uh, is, is the, major, um, the major driver and the major uh, factor that's preventing us from addressing this problem. A gross misallocation of capital and of course a large amount of that uh, going into uh, roughly by some studies 100 million or so a year going into lobbying and false research designed to stall progress on dealing with what is probably one of the biggest problems that we have ever faced. Um, you probably all heard the, 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 the mathematics behind the carbon budget, um, but just to put it uh, in context, if the world is going to stop things from getting pretty catastrophic and soon, uh, we have to leave most of the world's fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, we don't have a lot of leeway there. We can aim for a higher target or maybe go for a 50% chance of the two degree target rather than two thirds, but the result is still the same. We've got to leave most of it in the ground. And of course, the problem there is that most of these reserves are actually already above ground in the books of the companies and the countries that own them. The auditors have signed off on the book value of these assets, and that is reflected in the market value of the assets in what, in what people, for the companies, what uh, people are willing to pay for them. So getting serious about climate change is really getting serious about stranding the assets of these companies worth many trillions of dollars. And this is no uh, radical, um, sort of back of the envelope result. This is uh, results that have come from Shell and Exxon themselves. Um, of course, um, stranding assets will only happen if we get to the two degree threshold. And that, that if is a, is a very big if. It's not inevitable, of course. Um, but there are lots of uh, signs of uh, optimism, um, and, and Tim's talked through a couple of them, but I'll just put through. This is, has this is gone over in the first report, which is up on our website, and you can check at your leisure. Um, the first is, is regulation. So, of course, we've got the Paris 2015. Uh, negotiations uh, hopefully will not be another Copenhagen and all signs actually are probably pretty positive, much more positive I would say than the, the lead up to the Copenhagen conference. But really you've got to look to the sub-national action, um, renewable energy targets, carbon pricing and other forms of um, direct action happening uh, nationally and sub-nationally sub and regionally. And also regulation against health impacts. It's really important to remember that climate change is only one aspect of the damage that fossil fuels cause. Um, and you just have to look at China's war on pollution to see how serious uh, this, uh, the, the impacts can be and the reaction to it, which of course also has the nice consequence that it helps drive action on climate change. Um, technology change, um, Tim's talked about um, solar cost plummeting. Just thought I'd raise that in, in the last uh, couple of days, Barclays in the US has downgraded the credit rating of the entire US electricity sector because of threats from solar panels. Um, so it's, it's really happening right now. Uh, and then of course, uh, politics, um, fossil fuel campaigns and uh, oil, and, oil and gas companies now recognize uh, NGOs and other stakeholders as the single greatest risk to their profitability of future pro um, projects. And of course, in this basket, in a different, very different context goes um, the, the divestment movement. So we really see uh, in our reports, there are two aspects to uh, the divestment movement, so to speak, as a social change movement. Uh, the first is the movement targeting institutional investors like universities, like religious groups, like local councils and foundations. And that's the, that's the focus and purpose of our first report, um, trying to arm advocates and, and asset managers at these institutions uh, to drive that change and drive um, moral leadership at that level. And then the second aspect, which is probably more relevant to a lot of you today, although we are at a university, um, but uh, is, is the personal aspect. And, and this really uh, goes to personal ownership of shares, but also bank accounts and superannuation funds. And that is what's contained in the report that we're launching today. It's, it's got more of a um, sort of an emotive um, focus, but um, a lot of the research is the same between both, but the, 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 the purpose and function is a bit different. Um, Ox uh, an amazing study from Oxford University has shown that the divestment, that the divestment tactic or strategy has been extremely uh, successful in working in the past to curtail damaging industries. Of course, it doesn't work by actually uh, taking money away, although that's the, the action. 
Um, it, it works by driving stigma around an industry, making it harder for them to operate, uh, compelling action from government, and make actually things like making it harder for them to get good um, uh, uh, labor, good skilled labor, and so on. Um, this is the fastest growing divestment movement in history. So um, a lot of uh, cause for optimism around this. So divestment is about ethical investing, but many people don't want to invest ethically, although maybe they should, but they don't want to, or actually they legally cannot. If they're trustees of, um, of some money, by law, uh, tested very clearly in, 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 in the legal um, common law, uh, they cannot. They cannot consider ethical considerations. Um, but, of course, they can consider financial considerations. In fact, they have to. That's what trustees do, consider financial risks. And as I've discussed, um, fossil fuels are uh, a financial risk. So um, considering environmental damage under this rubric, this is called so-called responsible investing. Uh, and this involves considering, measuring, and responding to, to this financial risk, and responding to what's sometimes called a carbon bubble. And of course, the thing about a, at a bubble, about a bubble is that everyone who recognizes it thinks that they can get out before everyone else can get out, which means that it's fundamentally sort of unpredictable. Um, and so these risks are uh, quite serious. Even, even a small chance of a very large risk is very serious, um, as we know from right thinking about climate change. And um, this is something that, that asset managers are now starting to pay very serious attention to uh, around the world, and in Australia, I would add it as well, although less than we might like to see. Okay, so how does all of that apply to you? Well, if you own shares, you might want to use some of the information in our reports or in other information from, from Tim's group and so on, um, and uh, think about divesting, or if you're not um, so gung-ho on the ethical angle, taking a more of a responsibility angle and um, look at reducing, tilting, or hedging your carbon risk. Uh, but for most of us, the question of divestment is really about banks and superannuation. So I'll go to that next. So superannuation, most of us don't think all that much about our super. That's why Australians, on average, uh, waste more of their money on super fees than they do on electricity. And maybe we would be more engaged with our super funds if they asked us more interesting questions. For example, they might ask us, should we invest your money with ethics in mind as well as returns? And if they did, according to research from the Australia Institute, uh, they'd find around half of their customers do think that they should invest with ethics in mind. They could also ask, uh, should we invest in coal and coal seam gas? And again, they would find roughly one in, one in four would say, no, you shouldn't. And uh, this was actually 12 months ago, so I'd be very interesting to see how that had changed as a result of the divestment movement in that time. What are the options for you if you're thinking about divesting your super? Well, you can think um, ethically again. And there are, unfortunately, a limited number of options, but there are options, and they're outlined in the report. There's a number of superannuation funds and some managed funds that you can go to, and um, it's very heartening to see a very rapid rate of increase in this area, and it's likely to, to continue. Um, if you're more concerned about what they call responsible, uh, responsible um, risk management with carbon, you should look at the Asset Owners Disclosure Project. This is run by John Hewson, another great radical on climate change. Uh, and they basically survey and rank large asset managers uh, and assess their uh, management of carbon risk. And you can look at, there's quite a number of Australian super funds that are listed there. Okay, banks. So data collected from market forces uh, through uh, market forces are collected through, uh, no doubt, a lot of uh, trawling through terminal data, shows that the big four banks in Australia lent something close to 19 billion uh, to coal and gas infrastructure over a period uh, 2008 to 2013. The biggest lender was, the, was ANZ, Westpac was the least, the other two are in the middle, but they're all in, in the multi-billion dollar area. Um, so these banks play a small part in the overall lending to these projects, but they're super important. It's very hard for these projects to get off the ground without a major Australian bank involved. And um, that's why it's so important that these banks consider both the risks of the associated with the projects, but also the ethical implications expressed, hopefully, through consumer preference. Uh, two other points that we raise in the report. Renewables, these banks are uh, increasing their funding of renewables. Uh, the largest is Westpac, which claims that it's 50% of its funding uh, for, for electricity is in renewables, but that doesn't include fossil fuel extraction or transport, so it's still a minority um, of its overall sort of energy uh, loans. The other thing is that these um, loans are actually a very small part of their overall business, so it's, sort of, it's not as if they really need to be investing in these industries, and as we, as we heard, um, 
there are examples, international examples of banks that are ruling out expansion, uh, funding expansions of coal ports in the Great Barrier Reef. And again, the report outlines a very large list. Luckily in this area, there's a lot more options of smaller banks, uh, credit unions, mutual uh, building societies and so on that uh, don't invest in fossil fuels for whatever reason, just because they're too small, but uh, they're very happy to accept new customers who are motivated by this. Um, the other aspects to divestment if, um, uh, or to this whole uh, topic, which we go through in both reports, if, if divestment is not your thing for whatever reason, there's another option which is engagement. That's essentially talking with um, either the companies that you own shares in or your superannuation fund or the banks. Um, I won't go through this now, but there is a new group. It's, it's quite a big thing in the United States and uh, um, shareholder advocacy has been very important in getting uh, a whole bunch of new standards in, in play in the United States, especially church investors are behind that. It's not a big thing in Australia, but there's a new group, uh, the Australian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, that's trying to get some of that underway and um, hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. The final thing I just wanted to go over is you might, have, you might have, some of you might have noticed that if there's a difference between ethical investing and responsible investing, that it might seem to suggest that um, ethical investing is risky. You might lose a bit of money investing like that. Um, of course, that's a major consideration for, for all people who get confronted with this, this question. And um, so we did a bit of research into this and um, uh, it was based around a little bit of modeling that we asked the US analysts at Aperio uh, to do for us. Basically what they do, I'll just describe it really briefly. They took the ASX 200, um, they took out 21 companies that we identified as having the biggest exposure to, to fossil fuels, where their, their business model is most dependent on fossil fuels. It was equivalent to about 5% of the market. Um, they, they excluded this and then they used their risk models to um, optimize a portfolio uh, based on the remaining stock and then they simulated it over the last 10 years. And they found basically that there was a small bit of tr uh, increase in tracking error, which is variation from the index, almost no uh, impact, like negligible impact on, um, on returns. Now this might seem like a, an amazing result, but it's really not. Um, and as we point out in the report, um, asset managers uh, at Russell, um, uh, analysts at Russell um, did a survey of 40 different um, uh, research projects on um, socially responsible investing and ethical investing and they found, quote, no necessary performance penalty from uh, screening out social or environmental damage um, and other evidence that shows you can actually uh, eliminate most unique risk from your portfolio with, with between 15 and 20 companies. Obviously, if you exclude more, it's going to be a greater risk, um, but you can, you can get good returns with a smaller number of companies excluding environmental, environmentally damaging um, sectors. Really what we should have done is focused on, as has been point out, pointed out to me, focused on, as well as doing the modelling, um, focused on the, on the funds that are actually doing well. And there are a number of funds, um, if you're interested in this, you can find that there are a number of funds that are outperforming their peers uh, without investing in having low investment in fossil fuels or no investment in fossil fuels. So the take home message from all of this is that you don't need to invest in fossil fuels to get good returns. But on the other hand, if you're ethically motivated and divest, you're protecting yourself from the carbon bubble. And even if you aren't ethically motivated, uh, you can divest, uh, even if you aren't or you can't divest because you're a trustee for whatever reason, you can take steps to reduce your exposure. And uh, I hope that our reports are useful to this extent and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tom. And um, for those of you wondering about that last point, it's um, the, the graph on page eight of the report is the, the one in mind. It, it looks like one line, it's actually two, um, tracking the, uh, the, the, the fund that's excluded those 21 companies, or the, the portfolio that's excluded those 21 companies, just to illustrate that point for you. Um, before we go to the, the next speaker, Trevor Thomas, um, just been asked to play a, uh, a very short, uh, video of a few minutes, which uh, we may need. Do we need to reduce the lighting for this? Let's see. Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. And 
it's tremendous. And um, how many times have we spoken this evening about the, the pace of change? Uh, that's uh, a small amount of instigation. Um, but some, some, the next speaker is someone who is actively involved in helping people deliver that kind of instigation. We've heard about the, the fact that there are so many options out there for, for people who want to disassociate their money with fossil fuels. Well, Trevor Thomas is in the business of doing exactly that, not just helping you um, find fossil fuel options, but also use your power as a, uh, as a customer and as a shareholder and as a, um, yeah, someone engaged with, with institutions to, to force change. Um, Trevor is, um, is the director, director of Ethinvest, which is an ethical investing firm. Um, he joined Ethinvest in 1997, having just returned from six years in South America working in economic development. Um, Trevor graduated in economics at Sydney University and has an MBA from Eastern University in Philadelphia. Um, Trevor makes a point that he cycles to work and his super fund is fossil fuel free and uh, helps many others achieve the same. So hand over to Trevor to talk about some of the options and pathways for you. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, everyone. I asked for that clip to be shown, not because I like George Monboy channeling David Attenborough so much, as um, uh, because we're about changing an ecosystem and, uh, and uh, we need to set some wolves free. So I'm going to talk about that this evening. Um, this week in the uh, Financial Review on Tuesday, Matthew Stevens in his Companies and Markets column uh, wrote the following. Uh, there is scant awareness across all investment tiers of any source, sort of dedicated campaign for coal divestment. Awareness of 350.org in particular is very limited among investment professionals, it said. This is a report that was prepared for the Minerals Council by a company called JWS. The report said investors were aware of environmentalists' general arguments about coal, but that overwhelmingly these claims hold no sway in their investment decisions or advice. Interestingly, the investors interviewed by JWS Research reported little or no direct contact by advocates of coal divestment. The investors said also that they experienced very little reported pushback from either institutional or mum and dad investors. That sounds like a challenge to me. And I'd like you to rise up this evening and um, this year to take that challenge with me. So I'm gonna talk about divestment in three steps. The first step, um, and I'm thinking here particularly about superannuation and investment money. Um, it applies generally, but um, particularly looking at super and investments, the first step is to get the fund manager to acknowledge their exposure and articulate their approach to managing risk around, for, around fossil fuels. The second step is to challenge the fund manager to divest their fossil fuel holdings. And the third step is to divest yourself. I've called my three points the dumb question, the smart question, and send in the wolves. The dumb question. You're spending an hour or two this evening investing your time. The dumb question will require an extra 15 minutes of your time. And the dumb question is simply to ask your financial advisor or your investment manager or the trustee of your, of your superannuation fund, what is my current exposure in my investments to fossil fuels? Do you have a policy to manage carbon risks? Do you invest in companies that are promoting the expansion of Australia's coal exports? Uh, Tom's boss, Richard Dennis from the Australian Institute, likes to call Australia the Saudi Arabia of coal. And we're looking to double our exports by opening the Galilee Basin. So let's start with a dumb question. What's my exposure? Please, can you tell me? If enough of us start asking that question, it will cause a big headache at all the different funds management organisations because they're not set up to answer it. So I think it would be good to hit financial advisors all over Australia and fund managers and superannuation trustees with this question to get them thinking. The dumb question. So what's the smart question? As uh, Tom was saying earlier, 
The overriding principle of superannuation in Australia is the sole purpose test. Trustees have to invest money for the sole purpose of providing retirement benefits for the members of the fund. So it's actually quite difficult for them to categorically refuse to invest in a certain class of investment. It's very hard for them to take a very broad brush approach. Now, in the report tonight, the fantastic thing is that we've seen there's very little tracking error in excluding those top two tiers of investments. Um, where we can run into a bit of a challenge, though, is that often you look down to the next tier, tier three, and they're the sorts of companies, BHP, Rio Tinto, and um, West Farmers, that own two huge coal mines, that people kind of expect to be excluding if they're excluding fossil fuels. So um, there's a challenge there. The way that I think we should respond to that challenge is to line things up in order and knock them down one by one. So we can do that two ways. We can, either, we can take the approach outlined in the report, which is to identify those companies that rely pretty much exclusively on fossil fuels to generate their revenue and, and earnings, or we can take those fossil fuels that are most egregious. And um, thermal coal, for reasons uh, that uh, Tim has pointed out, is certainly top of that list. Um, and I think this is why this is a smart question, because the trustees of superannuation funds and the managers of investment funds have got this legal responsibility to make wise decisions. Superannuation is by its very nature a long-term investment. Even if you're retired, you've still got a substantial life expectancy. So, so superannuation funds have to think in terms of decades of investment risk. The sorts of risks that uh, Tim has been talking around about uh, around coal and thermal coal in particular are, are extreme. We're already seeing significant damage being done to portfolios that are invested heavily in coal. And the outlook is relatively bleak. Internationally, Citigroup and Goldman Sachs um, and Barclays and others have been speaking about the significant risks. So I think the smart question is to ask the trustees of, so, of superannuation funds and, and investment managers, are they putting short-term profits by investing in, poten in potential new coal mines ahead of your long-term benefit? Are they actually abrogating their fiduciary responsibilities by making these dangerous investments with your money? So I think we can use the nuance of, the of, of that question in the law actually to strengthen our arguments. Um, if you want to be really smart, the magic word, and I shouldn't really disclose this, but the magic word in the financial services industry is complaint. If you phone up and you're not happy about something and you don't say the word complaint, the person at the other end of the line or the other side of the desk may be able to sneak past. But if you say that you want to make a complaint, that triggers an automatic complaint resolution mechanism. Things have to be escalated, it has to go to certain people, and it's a major headache. You really want to avoid a complaint. So if you can frame your question or your concern as a complaint, if you can lodge a complaint that the trustees of your superannuation fund are abrogating their fiduciary responsibilities by making short-term investments in short-term speculative fuels like coal rather than things that are of long-term benefit to you, you will send a ripple effect much more profound, deep and lasting through the organisation that you're speaking to. So, the, so that's setting up the smart question. And the smart question simply is, please can you remove the risks associated with coal and other fossil fuels? And please, if you can't do it immediately, can you commit to a timeline of exiting in a, in, a, in a timely fashion? Or I'll face no responsibility to take those risks myself and leave your fund. So the third option, the send in the wolves option, is actually to divest. If the dumb question takes 15 minutes and the smart question takes half an hour to an hour, the send in the wolves option takes one to three hours. It takes a little bit more time. It's not actually very easy to move superannuation funds in Australia. We seem to have made an industry, uh, built the industry around making it difficult. There's any number of reasons why superannuation funds won't roll over their mo your, your money quickly. There's always some wrinkle or problem, it would seem. I think that fund managers ultimately will only hear our voice if we speak the language of the market. And the vocabulary of the market is simple and binary. Buy and sell. 
Now, I can't make any recommendations um, about superannuation funds to you from the podium this evening. It's against the law, unless we sit down and do a needs analysis and I understand all your personal circumstances first, which I'm happy to do, but we'd be here all night. So the, the, I can mention, though, a few names of companies that have made public commitments around the areas of fossil fuel for you to investigate. Because if you want to divest, you actually want to move your money into a place where it's doing more good. And so there are a number of options out there. Um, as has already been mentioned, AMP yesterday announced that its responsible investment leadership funds would essentially avoid tiers one and two in the uh, Australia Institute report that you've been given tonight. Anything with more than a 20% exposure to mining thermal coal, exploration of de and development of oil sands, brown coal, coal-fired power generation, transportation of oil from oil sands, or conversion of coal to liquid fuels feedstock is knocked out. So that knocks out pretty much tiers one and two. Um, and that's a huge step. I think um, as a result of that, I actually sent that press release through to Mr Stevens from the Fin Review um, and said, I think this is actually significant. And he wrote back and said, I'm sorry, today's deadline's just passed, but th you're right, this is profoundly impacting and I will look at it. So um, he's not known for being particularly progressive, so I'm pleased to hear his response. Um, Australian Ethical Investments has been around for many years, um, about 20, and uh, they have had a, a long-standing history of screening out uh, fossil fuel investment. They may still have some uh, exposure to gas, but they certainly avoid coal, uranium, oil and coal seam gas investments and have stuck to those exclusions. Their sc screening process is very rigorous. Hunter Hall, as has been mentioned, yesterday announced an exclusion on all fossil fuels full stop. That's the cleanest clearest break we've seen. That's fantastic and we're very we're delighted to see that. Uh, Unisuper has got plans to avoid companies directly invested in fossil fuel exploration and production but will include utilities and mining companies. And there's a, a group called the Emerald Superannuation Wrap that was set up by the Ethical Advisors Co-op a couple of years ago which has a number of different options on there which are fossil fuel free and our company offers a couple of investments there. Um, if you have a self-managed super fund, then you just have to look in the mirror, really, and ask if you've got any fossil fuel investments and what are you doing about it. I think it's clear that the first few wolves have already been set free and that things actually are changing already. So let me encourage you this evening to take 15 minutes to ask a dumb question, half an hour to ask a smart question, and to two hours to, to send the wolves in to take a divestment action. Thank you. That was great. Um, and as someone who's in the, the business of helping pe people encourage them to, uh, to contact their superannuation fund or their institution, I assure you that I'll go back and look at all the email actions we've got set up and make sure the word complaint is in there as often as possible from this weekend on. Um, so we've got to the point now where um, we've got some discussion, some, some question, a question and answer session for the next half hour. I think that we've got these mics are for roving, so we have some help here. Is it best to keep one mic at the front and one around? So, great. So maybe just raise your hand if you have a question on for any of the speakers at the front here. Yeah. Um, yes, I'd just like to know what anyone thinks about Clive Palmer being in Senate, and what would be the point of that? I don't understand where we're going with that. <laughs> Who wants to be sued? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Julian? <laughs> I mean, as with a lot of things to do with Clive, it's pretty hard to know where to start. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see how how, how it plays out. And uh, it's very, like, he's clearly got a, a, a business interest in... It, seem, it does seem that there are some conflicts of interest that he's going to have to try very hard to manage, although he, he reckons that his senators uh, are not him, so they can vote on things that weigh in on his, on his business interests. Um, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. I do, the, he, is, um, he seems to be suing pretty much everyone at the moment. Um, he's just announced he's going to sue the Great Barrier Reef um, Marine Authority. And so, yeah, probably better not to comment too much. Yeah, it just makes me relieved that I work in finance and investment rather than rather than politics. But it's a, it's a it's a very good question. Um, 
I would just like to know, because um, uh, there, there's a whole area of community owned renewables and basically not just divesting, but actually putting wealth creation back into the community. And could someone reflect on that? There is a, there is a very quick reference to that in, in the report and it's great to see interest around that. And unfortunately, if the government gets its way, it might be the only area of progress in renewables in the foreseeable future. Um, in Canberra, we've got a, a solar farm that's getting up and that's very exciting to see, but I don't know, do you have any experience with community renewables? Um, I was gonna, actually going to answer it in a different way because it's a very small area. If you have a community involvement that's, that's up and running, it can work, but the Australian government's doing everything it can to undermine renewables. So one of the points uh, that the investor group in climate change, which I'm involved in, uh, made in our RET submission is that if the Australian government continues to do what they're doing then the capital that we are going to take out of fossil fuels has to go into the solution, it's going to go offshore. Just trying to make the point that the capital will go into renewables, as I pointed out, it is already going in, billions, hundreds of billions are going in every year and it's all going in offshore courtesy of our government. So if the government wants our super to keep getting directed offshore, that they just keep undermining the RET. Um, it's an exciting area for the retail investor and for communities and um, a couple of the foundations that we're involved with are, are putting money into developing a toolkit that will be available soon for communities who want to set up um, uh, renewable energy projects so that it's, it discusses different legal structures and the way to do that cost effectively because there are all sorts of opportunities out there for communities to put um, particularly solar panels on the roofs of buildings that are operating all day, so you're actually generating, the, the power that you're generating off the roof is going, coming straight off your power bill. So there's all sorts of opportunities where the investment returns are, are very reasonable and, um, and you can feel like you're contributing locally as well as, um, uh, as making a difference on climate change. Thanks. Um, for Tim, my question is that a lot of, sorry, let me rephrase, the, the last great hope of the people that think coal mining will generate great profits is that Indian demand for coal, especially from that Galilee Basin or the Liverpool Plains, um, will pick up creating that demand. What do you think? the factors at play are for that, and for Trevor, how do you go about getting exposure to the energy industry when so much of the ASX is dirty energy and the government's so intent on destroying what little clean energy we have? Yeah, um, your question is dead on the money. It's certainly something I spend the vast majority of my time studying, um, which is India. India is the last crutch of the coal industry in particular. China was the great hope for the last decade, but now that they're going X growth in uh, coal demand, India's coming up behind them. Now, we put out a report last month, we, IEFA, um, just highlighting one point, which is that the actually we did it in conjunction with market forces, Julian, um, highlighting the point that the cost of imported coal-fired power generating capacity in India is actually prohibitive relative to their cost of electricity in India. So they can still use domestic Indian coal and produce it very cheaply, but by the time you take coal from the middle of Australia rail transport it to the coast, ship it across through a brand new coal, fire, coal port and then land it and convert it over there. It's actually cheaper for India today to do renewables, to do hydro, to do electric, to solar or wind uh, or energy efficiency. Any of those measures are far more uh, cost effective than imported coal fired power generating capacity. So a lot of the work we look at is the risk of stranded assets. The last thing Australia should be doing is investing tens of billions of dollars in developing the infrastructure to open the Galilee, knowing that it's effectively going to be stranded before you've even spent the money. Um, I'll finish on one point, if I could, which was um, a different way of answering it. There was a great report just saw that today from Goldman Sachs. So ultimately it's an investment bank, they live to make money, and the front page of their report says they do not expect any new capital to go into um, the coal sector 
um, for the foreseeable future for greenfield coal expansion. So I thought that's pretty telling. I mean, they're there to make a buck, not to worry about the future. Um, so how do you invest in uh, the energy sector in Australia uh, because the energy companies are so dirty? Uh, two words, New Zealand. Mighty River Power and Meridian Energy are both listed on the ASX and, and in terms of large utilities that have got good exposure to, to renewables, that's, that's pretty much the only options at the moment except for small companies that are commercialising new technologies and aren't yet profitable. So we have clients who've got small investments in those areas but it's a pretty sad place to be investing unfortunately. Hello, I just want to thank you all for your time this evening. It was a really great presentation. Uh, now, Trevor, you made mention that this uh, divestment um, has the opportunity to do more good, or another way of looking at it is uh, it has the opportunity to do less bad. Is there any way for investors or for beneficiaries of investments uh, to ensure that their investments are actually doing good as opposed to less bad or more good, if you get what I mean? So the whole trend in impact investing, for example. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that um, one of the exciting things that we see in the industry is that the, the emergence of the language around impact actually sweeps up into all that we've been talking about since the 80s in terms of ethical investment or responsible investment, socially responsible. This idea that we are trying to align um, the outcomes associated with our investments with our core, with core values and with, with, with seeking good is actually a, a helpful, um, is helpful language and there are all sorts of opportunities um, to uh, do positive things. There are all sorts of things outside of the energy space. The energy is easy, it's efficiency and, renew and, and renewables, great, but there are all sorts of areas in which we can invest which enhance human life and, cr and, and sustainability. And the amount of money going into those positive investments is increasing exponentially. And we're a little bit slow to pick it up in Australia, but it's happening here. Um, it's happening very significantly in the US. This is the uh, second event with Sydney University I've attended this week. The first was with the uh, International Energy Agency, looking at trends around energy generation in the world, and they've got some bold trends in terms of a switch from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. But on the question of this divestment movement, they brought up the matter of carbon capture and storage, which we often kind of laugh at as a, as a possible solution, but they have made the point that with technologies such as solar and certainly fracking in the US, we've seen some quite extraordinary sort of innovation and cost curve, so maybe it is, it, is, it is a feasible technology. So has any thoughts been put to the impact of that technology with regards to the divestment movement? Because assumedly that means the coal can come out of the ground and maybe even the divestment movement may push fossil fuel industries towards accelerating the development of that technology. Um, I have a strong view about carbon capture and storage. I see it as an absolute white elephant that has been perpetrated by the coal industry globally to uh, give them an excuse that, don't worry, we've got a solution, it's just 10 years away. It was 10 years away 10 years ago and it's still 10 to 20 years away today. Uh, I thought there was a telling point in the Goldman Sachs report today that said that one third of all carbon capture and storage projects that were on the planning board a year ago have now been shelved in one year. A third of the global carbon capture and storage projects have been shelved. The governments aren't willing to fund it. The corporates certainly aren't going to throw their money into it. They don't think it's a profitable industry. It's just, it's a it's an absolute white elephant. It's just an attempt to dissuade the, um, well, to con the market is my view. Um, it's extremely expensive. There have been two carbon capture and storage projects opened in America in the last 12 months, and both of them came in 100%, 200% over budget in terms of the capital cost. It was already expensive, and coming in double your budget means it's more than double your price of the technology, it requires a carbon price of 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars. We don't even have a carbon price if, if Abbott has his way at all. So um, I don't think you need a carbon price anywhere near 20, 30, 40 dollars. Renewables will do it for you for 20. You don't need carbon capture and storage at 60. So it's an absolute myth in my view. Um, the Australian Coal Association had a, a clean coal fund which um, <laughs> 
not too long ago, before they folded back into the Minerals Council, they turned into a coal fund, uh, which shows how dedicated the industry is to its long-term <laughs> sustainability, how, how convinced they are that it's going to contribute to that. I'm surprised to hear that from the IEA, because the graphs that I've seen from the IEA show it coming online commercially no earlier than 2030, and having a very small um, slice of the, of the pie, of the, the wedge is very small. Um, but the other side to this is it's really important to keep in mind the, the recent IPCC report that showed, yes, we can still do it if we pull our finger out and get really serious about it right now. We can still stay below two degrees. They assumed CCS. They're talking about uh, biological CCS, but they assume it later in the century. So um, it's important to differentiate between what the industry talks about in terms of CCS, you know, burying it under the rug, under, underground somewhere. Um, which, you know, some people do think is potentially possible. It's clearly going to be extremely expensive. Why would you waste that on coal? I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to bury carbon, you should be burying carbon from the, from the, from the, uh, the, the you know, least carbon per energy output, which would be gas. Why would we waste that? And, and the other thing is that you have to use a lot of energy to get it underground. So you're actually um, creating more carbon that you then have to bury. So it's an extremely expensive um, way to do it, uh, but CCS per se is going to be necessary. Some, some form of CCS will be necessary over the century. Yeah, I might, might just correct what I said. It is totally engineeringly possible, it's just not financially viable. So I have no problem with the technology, well it's not totally proven, but in terms of keeping the gas down there, or the carbon down there, uh, it en an engineer will say it'll work, but um, there's plenty of renewable technologies that are far more cost competitive. Yeah, again, echo the, the other person. Thanks for the great talks. Um, my question is, fossil fuels are used a lot um, with the, for, fuel, uh, for renewable power generation, well, for power generation, which we've seen, and we can see the inroads that are happening there with renewables into that sector. But fossil fuels are obviously used extensively as well for, for transport fuels. Um, and with the collapse of, of companies like Better Place and, you know, Tesla seems to be about the only sort of, you know, hope on the horizon. What are you, what's the thoughts for the panel in terms of what we can do with regard to getting fossil free if you want transport? Um, have a look at Tesla's share price. It's up, what, three, four, five hundred percent in 12 months, 18 months? Um, we're talking about a $10 billion company that didn't exist five years ago. I think Elon Musk is the next Warren Buffett. Uh, he's visionary, he's breathtaking, and he is going to make things, or, sorry, rephrase it, he's already made things happen, and he's going to make them happen so much faster. Everyone's been saying battery technology is coming, but batteries don't, technology doesn't change. Batteries are too expensive. They've been around forever. They'll never be cost competitive. Now, Tesla is going to reduce the cost of a battery in two years' time by 30% in two years. And he said that's his opening gambit. It's more likely to be 40%. And when he goes and spends $5 billion building one factory, he then comes out three months later and says, oh, by the way, I'm not actually going to build one $5 billion factory. I'm going to build hundreds of them. I need hundreds of them to transform the automotive industry. Hundreds times $5 billion is hundreds of billions of dollars. I wouldn't bet against Tesla or um, Elon Musk. Just before we continue, we've got a gentleman, I think, here in the in the brown jacket, and then um, I believe so. I just want to see, is there, are there any questions on this side of the room? Because we're just going up one side, there's one at the back there next. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, hi there. Yes, um, oh, okay. Who's Tesla? Google when you get home. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, I mean, he's a young man who's um, a multi-billionaire in America. Uh, Tesla is making the first, uh, well, not the first, it's the mass market electric vehicle in America. He's now exporting it um, increasingly around the world. The Chinese are looking at it. Norway is the top selling, Norway or Sweden is the top selling car last month in Norway when they released it. So he's, it's gone from nothing to being one of the most profitable and biggest automotive companies in the world in the space of a couple of years. No, your, your, your point, yeah, he's, he's planning to make 20,000 cars this year. So to your point, exactly, it's a drop in the ocean. China will make millions this year. But his aim is with this new factory is to get his target. He's aiming to make 500,000 cars 
a year by 2020. So he's just growing like that. And his share price is doing that, which gives him access to billions and billions of dollars of capital to invest to make that a reality. Uh, hi there. Th thanks again. I, I work for a small company that in, uh, puts uh, energy-saving technologies into businesses. And uh, what we're finding is that people are all over it because actually the price of electricity now makes it all work really quickly. Um, one of the things that we're also encountering is that the bigger your electricity bill is, the less able you are to cut your costs because the, your, your kilowatt hours is, the, is actually, um, we can save that, but we can't save network charges. And all. There needs to be a regulatory change because companies cannot cut their use and save money. It's just a bizarre situation that the that the provide, and we've got you know fossil fuel interest driving all of this. Um, so that's a comment. Now, what I wanted to say was, um, can you comment? You you said that um, uh, energy energy efficiency was was a, a big factor. I, I read a report by McKinsey's that said that America could save forty percent of its energy through efficiency. What's the progress like? Uh, obviously overseas because it's you know we're making little progress here. Your, your point is absolutely right in Australia for anyone other than a household and even for a household it's hard at the moment to, uh, to make renewables work because the regulator is working against you but to me the point you made is regulatory capture. If the regulator, which is the state government, is also the owner of the grid that we buy our electricity from and they're the owner of the generators, how can they regulate because they are totally reliant on the dividends coming from the grid and coming from the, from the generators. So to my way of thinking, selling off fossil fuel generating capacity, the unions might be against it, but it's a great outcome because it reduces the government's conflict of interest to actually do something. As soon as they don't own the grid or own the power generator, they can actually do their job, which is to regulate and let the financial markets, the, the real market, get on with the job within a, a constructive framework. So Australia's got regulatory capture at the moment, so you're dead right, it's bloody hard. But um, other countries actually import their fossil fuels, so therefore they're far more inclined to do something. Um, I'm just staggered by what Japan achieved in two years in terms of energy efficiency when Fukushima hit them. They had no choice, so they did it. I think everyone should just be studying energy efficiency initiatives in Japan and then taking it back to their country. But China's doing a huge amount. America is increasingly doing it. Obama's got behind energy efficiency. Um, and I do think batteries will transform the domestic market in Australia. At the moment, what, we've got a million, 1.2 million houses with solar on the roof. In three years' time, almost every one of those houses will have a solar um, on the roof, a battery in the garage, and therefore we won't be using the grid from six to nine o'clock at night, 95% of the year. So I think that'll just um, help transform the market irrespective of what the government does. Uh, my question is about move. Oh, sorry. I was just going to make three points, but you just raised the, the, the point about battery um, and it's, it, um, incentivizing moving off grid and then potentially having an impact for the, the you know, tend to be poorer people who are left on the grid. So there's actually, um, it's called the, the death spiral and it has potentially bad social outcomes. So it's a really serious policy problem if you care about social equity. Um, the other, the other thing was that uh, although it's not as, as impressive as in Japan, there is a great energy efficiency going on in Australia. It's one of the main reasons why um, the electricity sector emissions have gone down. And there's, that's actually being driven by consumers, but also by appliances. There is actually regulation uh, making our appliances more efficient, and that's just happening in the background uncontroversially reducing our emissions. The final thing is that there's this phenomenon called blowback. So if you become more efficient with the energy that you use, you actually free up energy sources to be used elsewhere. So energy efficiency is super important, but you've got to make sure you capture the savings and don't allow that energy to be used elsewhere in the system. And um, there, yeah, there's lots of case studies showing where that's happened, and there's a real risk that we become more efficient with our fossil fuel use to allow, to create more demand for fossil fuel use elsewhere and more, you know, just GDP churn that creates more demand as well. 
Uh, my question is about how we move to 100% renewables, not just 5% or 20%, um, and in a reasonable time frame, because that's what we need to do. Um, and in order to do that, I've heard that we need to use um, concentrated solar thermal and get that on the grid so that we've got the 24-hour power supply, uh, and that that's perfectly possible technologically, and there's various ways that we can do that. I know that the government's not going to support that, at least in the short term. Um, is there any possibility of raising, I know it, I mean, each one starts at just under a billion at the moment, they'll, they'll end up cheaper as we build them. Um, is there any chance of raising investment money to build the first one, show the way, kickstart it in Australia? I'll let uh, Tim comment on the, on the financial aspects of that. I believe it'll probably depend on the support that it might not get from the RET. Um, but yeah, that, I believe you're referring to the Beyond Zero Emissions um, Stationary Energy Plan that was a you know, visionary report and they've done a whole bunch of other ones on different areas of um, emissions use, you know, basically different parts of our society that create emissions. That was the very first one. I actually understand that they have now tempered their view on that and they now accept that there's a, more of a role for different energy sources. Um, storage has become so cheap so quickly and the panels as well. I mean, it's just the people who watch this, I have a friend who works in renewable energy policy policy and she just is exasperated at how quickly solar panel, the cost of solar panels has come down. It's just simply astonishing and as I don't think many policy makers are actually aware um, of how cheap it, how cheap it is. Um, I might, in terms of solar thermal, if we had the CFC arena and the RET then solar thermal would work perfectly. Um, obviously the Abbott government's trying to make sure we don't have any of those three. The uh, largest solar thermal plant just went online in America. Uh, the technology is still being improved, but uh, again, I would um, echo Tom's comment about the, uh, the need for energy diversity. You need hydro, you need wind, you need solar, you need offshore wind, you need uh, gas, possibly. Uh, you need all of, yeah, a little bit, but um, pumped hydro storage works in Europe. You actually need interconnected grids. So Australia does have a little bit of a problem in that we are an island, but renewables in Germany work because they're not an island. They're actually able to export their surplus renewable energy to France. Um, so that makes it that much easier for them over time. But anyone that claims there is this barrier that renewables can only be five or 10% of the energy sector, it's just bullshit. I mean, look at South Australia. Uh, sorry. Um, look at Germany, look at New Zealand, look at uh, Brazil. 80% of their energy comes from renewables. So it, it is really just an absolute furphy put up by the fossil fuel industry to say the grid can't do it. But what's, the grid can't do it tonight, tomorrow. But transition, we spend $10 billion a year on our grid already just to keep it operational. If we spend that $10 billion, maybe carved it back to eight and then spent it on getting the grid ready for renewables, the transition gets there a lot faster than any uh, politician or fossil fuel person will tell you. Just an additional point before we go to the next question, I think we've got time for about three more, uh, just so you know, um, is that this comes back to people's engagement with their financial institutions as well. I mean, one example, Westpac has put aside $6 billion to invest in renewable energy. That's very nice, but they need opportunities to be able to do it. And so in your engagement with your financial institutions, you know, if the big four banks want a policy, they can go and get it. They're, they're powerful enough. If they want something, they can go and grab it. If they want an increased rent, they can get it. If they want the Clean Energy Finance Corporation to exist so that they can match some, some funding with what they've set aside to put into renewables, they can get it. So they need to be advocating, you need to be advocating to them they're lobbying government to make sure the opportunities are created so they're not just setting aside these sort of pools of money that sound great, they're actually in a position to deploy those funds. There's another, just quickly, there's another aspect to divestment. Of course, we all get our electricity from a retailer and it's the retailers, especially Origin, but also AGL, unfortunately, recently has changed its tune a bit. Um, they are set to essentially have stranded assets if, they, uh, if the renewable energy target goes ahead. It's complex, there's a great report uh, coming out from the Australian Institute about it. If you're interested, it'll be in the next couple of weeks. But um, basically they stand to lose uh, because the, the renewable energy is cutting into their existing um, fossil fuel generation. And um, uh, you know, that's another aspect of divestment. You can uh, you know, ask them not to do that and then potentially change to a, a different retailer. And there are retailers that aren't, that are actually pushing for a stronger rent. 
I can't think, I mean, I know one in Victoria, but it's not available in New South Wales at the moment. But if you go to um, Solar Citizens or um, Save the Ret or any of these campaigning groups, get up, um, there'll be lists for sure. What you guys is doing is just terrific, you and your organisations. It's so important to, um, for people in these terrible times we've got to feel empowered. Um, I, earlier this year, got an um, email from Market Forces and, um, and changed my super into, uh, into local, local government super, and I felt more empowered by that than I did when I chained on to a, a gates of a coal mine last, last month. Um, my question is, uh, Market Forces' list of banks my credit union isn't on it, and I've written to them asking uh, what their exposure to, uh, to fossil fuels is. Um, my question is how many um, banks and credit unions aren't on the list? Uh, what rate are they responding? Um, basically that, yeah. We put that list together on demand, and so I, I don't know what the number is. Um, we keep learning of more every day. Um, and so, I mean, for, for us, we, we went, we went to some of the banks, the smaller banks or the sort of medium-sized banks and the large credit unions we're aware of and got positions from them. And the list the gentleman's talking about is that you know, we did this research, we found out which banks are investing in fossil fuel projects and companies in Australia. And so we went to the ones who didn't show up in that research and said, well, you, you seem okay, but what's your position so that we can put something up? And we, don't, we get their positions back on uh, where they stand on investing in fossil fuels and we just whack it up on the website verbatim. Uh, we don't judge it, we don't classify it in, in any really particular way, except that they have, they've given us a statement and we say what it is, but we get pe emails from people every day saying, oh, where's my credit union and where's my, where's my mutual or something like that, and whenever they do that, that's great because it's another opportunity to get another response, so please send it through and it'll go on the table. Can I just add that it's, it's good to ask the question, um, but you can make the assumption that a credit union or a mutual won't have any exposure because they can only lend to their members and I can't imagine any major fossil fuel companies becoming members of a credit union. Um, <laughs> uh, so by default they tend to be pretty clean. Um, apart, outside of the, the big four banks and Suncorp, um, there aren't many financial institutions in Australia that are large enough to have significant exposures to fossil fuels. So. Um, so the smaller the institution, the less likely, and certainly credit unions, mutual banks, and some of the smaller banks like Heritage Bank are basically home lending and personal lending institutions. So question at the back, and then we'll take one more from this side. Um, with the uh, shutting down of the um, Green Bank, I can't remember its official name, um, is there any possibility of uh, that facility to be privatised or...? What steps would, would be taken for the public to get involved and try and sponsor it, sort of like the uh, Climate Council? So you're talking about the CEFC, Clean Energy yes. Finance Corp? Yeah. Uh, I'd be very surprised because it works on leveraging the Australian government, federal government's um, credit rating. So they can raise money at the cost of capital to the Australian government and on lend it uh, and take a margin and that is very viable. It's a critical enabler of the private industry, but it requires the Australian government to have an interest in this area. And clearly the whole reason the government is trying to abolish the CFC is they don't have an interest here. So to privatise it, knowing the government's going to be fighting them, it's a, you're really pushing it uphill. To me, it's an absolutely critical um, instrument of, of encouraging the deployment of financial resources to the solution. You look at the development in Brazil, in Germany, in China and America, uh, they've got the equivalent of the CEFC in each of those markets. They are huge institutions. They're lending billions, tens of billions every year. They're making great returns to the government that owns them and they're enabling huge amounts of capital behind them. So to me, they're the absolute answer um, I don't understand why Tony Abbott doesn't go and have a quick chat to the German government and ask about their 100 billion euro um, K, KFW business. That's the German State Development Bank. It'll, I'll just add that it'll be interesting to see, uh, obviously there'll be other supports that'll be taken away, but the CFC, most of its loans are actually commercial, at commercial rates, I understand. There's some concessional, and there's a limit on how much can be concessional, but it's actually, it will have pulled a lot of the um, sort of um, commercial um, banks into that sphere already. So there'll be a sort of, it's already pushed 
a new uh, market development, at, unfortunately, at the same time that the rent and the carbon price will be taken away. But there, there is, there, some of the good will already have been done. The other thing is that the politics is quite interesting. It's not part of the repeal package. Like, it's, there's no bill to repeal it on the table at the moment. So we'll see what happens. Question here, then this gentleman won't let me leave the building alive if he doesn't get his question. So we'll finish with him. Um, I think it's a great point around the CEFC. I was working there until about a year ago, and I think it's a fantastic institution. And I'd urge everybody to maybe call their local member and ask them to keep it, because I think that's one way that we can maybe lobby the, the parliamentary process. Um, I had a reflection on Tesla. Um, I think Tesla does well because the cars look fantastic. So my question to each of you three, we always hear that sex sells. How do we sex up the superannuation industry and make the green superannuation industry more sexy than the current superannuation industry? Well, the only sexy part of investments returns and the best kept secret in Australia is that ethical investments return better than traditional investments. So we just need to get the message out that you don't have to sacrifice returns by screening your portfolios. Um, the research that's been done by the Responsible Investment Association shows across um, all asset classes and across um, all time periods, with one exception in, in uh, 16 pieces of data, there is uh, outperformance by the screened funds. So the idea that you have to sacrifice returns by investing uh, using eth ethical or uh, sustainability screens is a furphy. So um, we should, and it's interesting because it's the first thing that people think. So to sex up the superannuation industry, we need to tell the truth. <laughs> Tim, can you reflect on that with the IGCC perhaps as well? How do we sex up the IGCC? Uh, it's a very hard question. Um, how do you, well, the investor group on climate change is the finance industry's body to actually try and push through policy. Um, it's very hard at the moment. It's just a matter of persevering. Uh, at the end of the day, I think at some point the Australian electorate or the Australian governments are going to have to look at what is happening globally. I mean, I spent five years studying global renewable trends. That's what makes me an optimist, um, that you look at what China is doing every day and they're just, like last week, a small point, I don't think it was even mentioned in the Australian press, but China doubled their solar target. So their installs for solar by 2017 will be 70 gigawatts by 2017. They just doubled what their target was a year ago for, I think they were going for 35 gigs by 2015, and a year before that they are going for 20 gigs by 2015. They just, every year they double their target, and that's in wind, in solar, you know, they are actually going into nuclear, they're, going, they're putting in 30 gigawatts of hydro last year alone. So China's getting on with it. While we're stuffing around debating whether it's man-made, whether there's climate change problem, China knows the outcome. They have a government's focused on the long term. They're worried about their long term strategic positioning and they're going to rule the world because they're actually investing while we're stuffing around. Uh, but I mean, I don't know how we get around the Australian government, except maybe engage with your member, engage with your banks, engage with the government. I don't. Ultimately, I just look at the financial markets. Financial markets can solve anything if you give them the mandate. The amount of capital that's sitting there on Westpac's balance sheet, Combank's balance sheet, it's just hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, the CFC could mobilise tens of billions of dollars of new investment tomorrow if the government just let them do it in Australia rather than just sending the money offshore. Uh, just briefly, as a divestment advocate, I'm going to say divestment. And I do know uh, we share an office with the Australia, at the Australian Institute with a... Um, with a group that does uh, ES, um, environmental social governance research for um, as consultants for investors. And they have been inundated with uh, requests that have either come off the back of or are directly relating to divestment. Um, certainly super funds are institutions that are not used to getting any sort of interest, right? They complain about people not paying any attention to their fee structures and the details and so on. Um, some of them take advantage of it, but it's, you know, people who work in those in, 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 in some super funds do complain about that. And there's been an absolute, um, yeah, people are paying attention to the point where people who work in the um, responsible investment industry 
Um, I've actually also heard them complain that we've been trying to get people to pay attention to this stuff for years, and it takes you know Bill McKibben at 350 and the, the sort of compelling narrative around the carbon bubble and so on to drive that. Hopefully, it'll go beyond. You know, it doesn't need to be just about fossil fuels. There's all these other um, ills that we do with our investments as well as good that we can do. So, yeah, talking talking about. Uh, talking about the aspect of choice beyond just simply returns, and also, by the way, you're going to do better, or at least not as you know, not going to lose money by doing it. Um, before, sorry, I'm just throwing. I've just given the CFC a big rap, and as Tom mentioned, it's actually not dead yet. The government actually hasn't been able to undermine it to the point where they can kill it off yet, but. The, the ARENA is the other organisation that the prior government set up. It had bipartisan support and it's in an absolutely critical, equally critical area. What's ARENA? It's advancing Australia's knowledge and technology development in the whole renewable space. And Australia is a world leader with world leading universities like Sydney University transforming the world's solar industry with Australian scientists leading the way. And what's the Abbott government do? It wants to shut ARENA down. It's, ARENA's objective is to build Australia's technology leadership. That's how I would summarise ARENA. So CFC is to enable the finance that the scientists, our scientists, the Australian scientists are building. And the Australian government thinks it's a great idea to actually cut the knees off our scientists at the same time as they cut the financing off. It just doesn't make sense to me. Is electricity um, off-peak pricing critical for the survival of the coal industry? And what's the politics behind off-peak electricity pricing? I, I think time of use pricing is absolutely a critical enabler. If the regulator actually wanted to transform our grid, they would push time of use pricing a long way further than they already have. Uh, you might be aware time of use pricing means that the utility charges you a different rate depending on when you use your electricity. So th at the moment when I use my electricity between um, I think it's 3 o'clock and, and 9 o'clock at night or tw sorry 10 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night it's 50 cents a kilowatt hour. If I use it after 11 o'clock at night before 7 it's 10 cents. So it's a quarter of the price. Now, time of use pricing can actually encourage you to change your behaviour. Now, I've got solar on my roof, obviously, so I use all the electricity I can in the middle of the day because I'm going to get nothing if I sell it to the grid, whereas if I use it and to offset, I, I save 50 cents. So all my pool pump and all my, I do all, any washing, I've got a delay button. So we mentioned technology, a delay button on a washing machine. You could put actually delay buttons on your fridges and on your um, freezers, that sort of stuff. That's what America is actually doing. The Japanese are doing it for air conditions. Just put in regulations that say you've got to have the best technology installed. Best in class, not worst in class. Um, and then all of a sudden time of use pricing couples with solar, couples with a couple of kilowatt hours of battery storage and Two out of, well, maybe one out of every three houses in Australia's use of electricity from the grid drops by 90%, just with the battery and with solar and time of use pricing. But probably in Australia we need peak, um, critical peak pricing with, so you get a text saying, tomorrow we're going to charge you not 50 cents a kilowatt hour, but $2 a kilowatt hour if you use electricity during these. And you'd only do it for about four or 10 hours a year. And the, the, it's an it's a interesting concept, it's totally doable, but why would anyone agree to that? Because the utility might actually offer you 100 bucks or 200 bucks a year off your power price, if you agree. If you don't agree, then you don't get the surcharge, you don't get the saving. So it's probably getting way too technical, but time of use pricing is a key regulatory change to avoid the, you mentioned the, the issue of the bottom 10 or 20%, you don't want to hammer e energy poverty on the people that can't afford the change and really aren't going to drive consumption. If they can't change their behaviour, then make them exempt and hit the 80% of people who, who can change and would like to save money. Great. Um, I'm going to just invite Chris right back to the, the podium to finish up, but uh, just want to say thank you very much for that, that great level of engagement on, on this 
uh, it's, it's clearly a, quite an engrossing topic. Um, and I'm sure this is a conversation that's going to continue. Um, if you read the report and stay engaged in, in our work and, our, and the campaigns that we run, um, really look forward to putting this into action. But I um, just want to take a moment to say a great thanks to, to Trevor, to Tim and to Tom, and spare a clap or two for myself. <laughs> Good evening. Yes, I just wanted to uh, close this evening by echoing those sentiments. It's absolutely been an inspiring and informative evening, and I've learned a lot, and I've typed reams of notes and all the rest of it. So I wanted to thank specifically Tim Buckley, Tom Swan, Trevor Thomas, and our excellent MC, Julian Vincent, and also our partners for the night, 350.org, uh, Market Forces, and the Australia Institute. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it, and good evening. <laughs>